So, thank you, Logan. Um, so for those of you that haven't attended A Window to the Woods before, thank you for joining us. Um, we're just going to start really quickly by acknowledging that I think all of us here are from Maine and we are on the land of the Wabanaki. Um, and they're the original stewards and continue to steward the land that we are all teaching on, um, which is important to interact, um, to bring up when we're working with students um, to make sure that full history is there. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Main Tree and Main Project Learning Tree, um, so Main Tree is a nonprofit organization. Um, we do timber research and environmental education. Um, and Project Learning Tree is one of the projects of Main Tree. Um, so the top pro uh, three projects here are our education programs, and those are under my wheelhouse. Um, so I'll be able to talk to you um, for a few seconds at the end here about our Forest and Maine Teachers Tours that's gonna to be coming up this summer. Um, but our other project that, um, education project we have is our Forest Ecology Research Network, which is a community science program um, based in forestry in Maine. So um, today we're gonna to be talking all about careers in Maine forests. So I'm gonna do a little bit of an introduction and just frame things so everybody's on the same page about what we're talking about because we're going to be mentioning a few different things that we've done with students um and then we're going to have uh three folks from amc i didn't put these in any particular order for you guys they so don't have to worry about that um and they're going to share uh some of the work they've done and also how they've gotten into their positions with you all um and then at the end i'll also have some information for um some activities that can be done that are in the guides that you all will get if you haven't yet got them, um, that will be helpful as well. Um, so just to start off, um, we're gonna be using the phrase green jobs um, quite a bit, I think. Um, and that's been a term that's been coined recently by um, Project Learning Tree or used significantly by Project Learning Tree. And when we say that, we're essentially referring to any um, job or career that really um, in any way supports or restores the environment or sustainability. Um, so this can take a lot of different forms. Um, we're a forest-based organization and AMC has a lot of forests, especially in Maine, that, that's a lot of what they do. Um, so that will be a little bit of a sway of what we do here will be forest-based. And of course, Maine is very forested. So um, Maine as a state is also kind of swayed into the world of forestry, but Green jobs in general can also certainly mean um, green energy and wildlife and um, all of those jobs as well. <clears throat> I think we'll also be mentioning, um, this is a whole different curriculum than the one that you all get as a uh, part of this um, series. So green jobs is a specific curriculum that is for ages 12 to 25. Um, and it has quite a few different um, activities that kind of help folks, um, one, identify skills that they have and how they might um, be uh, really well suited in different types of careers. Um, and they also kind of allow students to simulate uh, what it might look like to be in those careers. Um, and also looking at their local community and kind of identifying who might work here, or who does work here. Um, so we're going to be mentioning this curriculum, and I just wanted to throw that up there so we're not confused. Um, actually, I think so. There's four different activities in this curriculum. Two of them are in the, the general guide that you all either have or will have after the session. So um, green jobs are incredibly important, especially um, at the moment that we're in, especially in Maine, um, the forest product sector is one of our biggest um, contributors to our economy here in Maine. Um, and these jobs are being not only created, um, but they're also uh, being vacated from retirement. Um, and the one that's not on here that's really impactful in Maine is um, loggers and also CDL drivers who transport logging. So all of those are under the realm of um, what we call green jobs as well. And they're really crucially important because we're looking at, especially in the forestry world and um, 
forest product sector, we're looking at a lot of folks retiring over the next uh, 10 years, let's say. Um, and so just making sure that students know that not only is this an opportunity, but it also is one that's continuing to grow and expand in Maine is super helpful. Um, so this is the last resource I was gonna mention right at the beginning here. Um, as part of the Green Jobs Guide, uh, Project Learning Tree has a Green Jobs Quiz. Um, and so you need a uh, access code to get that quiz, which I can help you get. If that's something you'd like to do with your students. Um, but it essentially is a personality quiz that aligns you up with careers that are environmentally focused. Um, so if you're in the classroom and talking about environmental topics, um, it can be helpful to kind of help students frame how they might be able to get involved with that down the line. Um, so for example, I'm working with a high school teacher that is um, English, an English teacher and is doing um, a couple different books on the environment with her students and she's having them take the green jobs quiz so they can kind of frame um, what they might be interested in doing in this realm if that's what they do. Um, so this is the results that come from one of the quizzes. Um, and it kind of tells you what personality type you gravitate most towards and what your skills are, um, and then what kind of careers there might be out there in that sector or in um, the green job sector for you. So with that being said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. I'm going to toss it over to Steph. Perfect, and I'm going to share my screen. So you have one minute here, and we'll have that up. How's that look for everybody? Perfect. Awesome. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us after school. If you're a teacher, I'm sure I know that that can be difficult. So we really appreciate you being here. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to all of you about the Green Jobs curriculum and how we've been able to incorporate that into what we're doing at the AMC. But first, I wanted to start it off with just a quick intro to what is the AMC in our education department. So I'm actually going to hand it over to our Vice President of Conservation Research and Land Management, Steve Tatko, to give us a quick intro to the AMC. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, it's great to be here with you all. It really, it's, uh, you folks are on the front lines of some big things, so I really appreciate all the work that our teachers put in out there across the state. But yeah, so who is the Appalachian Mountain Club? Because folks, I think when they hear AMC, sometimes they think we're the Appalachian Trail or they think we're just a hiking club or they think a number of different things. And, and um, we actually are not the Appalachian Trail. That's actually owned by the National Park Service. Uh, but we are uh, actually the country's oldest conservation group. We've been around since 1876. Um, we've got about 90,000 members throughout the Northeast with about 115 full-time employees and 200 plus seasonals working in our lodging and our research department, um, working on our trail crews. Um, and because we've been around for so long and because we've sort of focused on the intersection of conservation, recreation, and education, I, I like to think of us really as a people-oriented conservation group. So in a nutshell, when you think about the AMC, we are an organization that uses people's individual connections with places, with outdoor spaces, to develop a sense of stewardship so that then those people want to protect those places and make them accessible to others. And so, um, uh, you know, a lot of the, the stuff that we're famous for, like the professional trail crew program that, that we pioneered in the early 1900s, you know, the advocacy work around the, the creation of the White Mountain National Forest in 1918. Um, and, and even today, the 100,000 acres of, of forest land that we own here in the state of Maine, all in Piscataquis County, have come out of this interest of, of not only conserving places, but conserving experiences for future generations um, for the surrounding communities and from other people that normally would never have access to these regions. Um, so that's a kind of a very broad brush look at the Appalachian Mountain Club. But as it, as it trickles down to our individual presence in these states, you know, here in Maine, we have a little bit of, of all of the organization represented in our office here in Greenville. Um, and so that map you see on the, the left uh, is, our, is our property that we own here in the state of Maine. 
uh, just west of Moosehead Lake in the 100 Mile Wilderness region. And we have our regional office here in Greenville and, and out of this office, we have our education program that Stephanie heads up. Um, we've got the, the work that Carolyn and I do over in the land department. Um, and we've got facilities folks and marketing folks. And so there's a, a number of both um, professional year round jobs uh, and seasonal jobs. So there's just a huge need for people that wanna work in these spaces. So I'll let Stephanie take it away. Thank you, Steve. All right. So hi everyone, my name is Steph Perkins. I am our educational coordinator for our work here in Maine. Um, and one of the things that we like to do when we're talking about green jobs is share a little bit about our own career pathways. So both Steve and Carolyn will also be doing that as well. Um, but I come from a classroom teaching background. I taught at the high school level for seven years in Madison, Maine, um, before I came to this position. I'm a registered Maine guide now, which came out of this position. Um, and I also was a Peace Corps volunteer in Tanzania. So that's how I got into education. I received my degree from bio in biology from Wheaton, thinking I was going pre-med, um, joined the Peace Corps and found out that I really love teaching. So that's how I got into education um, and I've been doing it ever since. So here at the Appalachian Mountain Club, we have the Maine Woods Community Youth and Environment Program. So we are working with students from pre-K all the way to 12th grade in Piscataquis County offering environmental education and youth development experience, experiences that connect them to this area that Steve just showed us around the 100 mile wilderness um, with the hope of fostering future environmental stewards. So we try to connect them with their own backyards, um, learning about natural resources and also engaging them in outdoor recreation opportunities. So what that means is that we teach things like forest ecology. Um, so we'll go into schools and we'll either do this, a lot of, a lot of schools out of COVID um, built their own nature trails, their outdoor classrooms, able to work with um, classroom teachers and, and help them engage in those spaces with their students. So we do a lot. Um, but we also do things at our own lodges as well. So we have students coming out on field trips. We also um, specifically work a lot around climate science, um, which has been a big push in Maine with the recent climate change education bill. And this has been a great space for us to introduce green jobs. So there's definitely a challenge around teaching about climate and we want to leave our students with hope for what is being done in our own local regions. So that's a great way for us to connect students with professionals who are already doing the work um, and help them learn about careers that they might be able to get interested in in the future. Um, so we do use that green job survey that Lena was talking about. I highly recommend it. It's great. The students are able to think about their own strengths and personal qualities. And the quiz does a really great job of matching them then with careers. And there's a paper version as well as an online version and both have worked really well with students depending on what your access to resources is. Um, but the way we engage students with green jobs um, is we have uh, speakers like Steve and Carolyn come in and talk about their careers. Um, sometimes they'll even listen to me talk about my career as an environmental educator. Um, and we're also able to bring them out on field trips. So we have three lodges in the Greenville region. And so students, this is a climate change, specifically a climate change class from Guilford, Maine. And they came out to learn about green energy. So all of our lodges are operating off the grid. So they're able to learn about solar power um, as well as other sustainable energy sources. So this was them coming out to lodge on a tour. Um, and then we're able to have 
speakers like Steve come in and talk about what they do. Um, so we have a day in the life of a forester and the students are able to get um, outside and learn about uh, our trees. How do we measure trees? How do we use trees? Um, especially where we're coming from in Piscataquis County when we have conversations around climate science, saying not cutting down trees isn't really something um, that's an option. We have a huge forest product industry, but it's how we manage those forests that's important. So Steve does a really good job of, of introducing that to students. So they're measuring trees in this picture with our fancy fancy built more sticks or tree calculators like Steve calls them. Um, and then we're also able to engage students in community science. So this is Carolyn, we had those same kiddos from Guilford come out and we were able to do some ice depth and snow depth measurements when talking about climate science. And Carolyn was able to speak about her job in research um, as a research forester. So, that is a quick intro to what we're doing on the education side. Um, and then I'm going to have Steve and Carolyn talk a bit about their professions, their career pathways, um, and what we're doing from a forest management side. So I think first up is Carolyn. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, like Seth mentioned, I'm a research forester with the Appalachian Mountain Club. Um, I started this position this in 2022. So here's a little brief history of my path to where I am now. So I didn't, I took a non-traditional kind of route after I graduated high school um, and involved kind of, I knew I wanted to do something working in the, with the environment or, or um, with natural resources, but I kind of wasn't sure what that was. So I kind of took different jobs working in sustainable agriculture and with different conservation crews in the Pacific Northwest um, and kind of found that I was really interested in forestry and wanted to pursue that and go back to school. So that's when I decided to, I went back and got my associate's degree and then finished school at the University of Maine and got a degree in forestry and parks recreation tourism management, uh, which pair well, I think, with Kind of what AMC is doing and and where um, and the organization what I do for them. Um, if you could skip to the next slide. So here, this is just a couple pictures I threw up of my past green work experiences that led me to where I am now. So, like I mentioned, I worked on a couple different farms, and those are some of the goats I worked with, and then conservation crews in the Pacific Northwest, and that was key those experiences really helped direct me to where I am today because, and especially for kids getting out of high school or I worked with a youth crew in, in the Northwest. So it was kids in high school or just after high school. And they got this experience to get paid to go do trail work or um, the picture in the bottom right there is actually doing invasive species removal along a power line corridor um, or you know cutting back brush and everything with mechanical tools. Um, but it was a really good way to meet with a lot of different partners and professionals in different fields. So we worked with like the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management or different departments within the state of Oregon. So that really helped shape, kind of direct me to, to knowing what I wanted to go back to school for. All right, you can go to the next slide. And then here is, so I ended up as a non-traditional student at the University of Maine, and that worked out for me really well going back to school later, I was more directed in what I wanted to pursue. I was able to um, take advantage of different research opportunities and different summer internships. And I think that's something a lot of students might not know too, is that um, depending, a lot of these, I know at least the University of Maine um, within their School of Forest Resources has tons of scholarship opportunities and opportunities for internships. So a lot of these departments will have, there's a lot of companies that want to hire students for the summer and they can get experience in these fields. And those are from nonprofits to industrial, you could go work on industrial forest land. So just all across the, the whole spectrum, you could find summer 
summer work. And that was really helpful too, to uh, make connections and then also pursue research opportunities. Um, yeah, and it just worked out really well going back to school later. I was able to do my own independent research projects and work with some faculty and with the Forest Service on that. So it worked out really well. All right, next one. There we go. Sorry, I'm the internet here. I'm a little behind, but uh, so this is, so now I'm at AMC and this is a slide and Steve, if you want to jump in at all too, this is, so this is some of the research. I only picked a couple things I've been involved with so far here. Um, but what we do at AMC from the, re we have a research department and Kai kind of bridge between the forestry and land management and the research department. And so I've been involved with helping them with installing different uh research projects or collecting different sets of data. So on the left, we have one of our climate mod, uh, climate stations monitoring, um, which we actually took some of those high school kids that came recently from Guilford. We went out and looked at um, our climate stations in the snow because they also record snow depth. So we went out and got to look at the climate station and look at um, how the snow depth was being measured. So this here measures uh, different factors from the air, from temperature, uh, relative humidity, and then kind of gets also the bottom part there measures a lot of soil information and kind of can tell us what when the soil is freezing, what the temperature is and moisture and things like that. Um, we actually have gotten involved with some of our research also involves archaeology. We own on our property, there's some several old law, uh, towns and areas that were connected to the logging in, in forestry industry in the um, 1800s and also to the Katahdin and Ironworks settlement. So that's where that picture is from. Um, looking at, we're able, fortunate to be able to start, um, have an archeologist part-time who comes and is very interested in um, looking at that community and the different possible structures that exist. And it's been cool. I've been able to go out with her and, you know, look for cellar holes and look, you know, be exposed to that. And also we had a field school, which is really cool. So she was able to have, you know, people who are just interested in archaeology come out to AMC for the weekend, like a long weekend and volunteer. And she, uh, the archaeologist taught everyone how to um, use the equipment and they worked together to sample some of these sites. And then the bottom picture is some of our new uh, sampling that we were able to do. That's my truck and we were able to set up, that's actually like a water filtration system kind of set up out in the field. And part of our, a big push on our ownership is doing a lot of um, uh, fish, pas fish passage and, and uh, uh, ecosystem like um, watershed restoration work. And so this is eDNA sampling we were able to do, and that's looking at uh, what type of um, material is in the water. And that can tell, once it's sampled, it can tell you what um, fish or invertebrates might be present in the waterway. And so we had a research intern, so that's another good opportunity too. We've had interns who are still in college come out in the summer and help collect data and so I got to work with our summer research intern going out and collecting lots of water samples on our streams and rivers. And this is just three of the many research projects that we have going on, but I thought I would touch on a couple of these. So they're pretty fun. So my job at AMC is another bigger part of my job is going to be focusing on early intervention silviculture within our our ownership and so that's going to a lot of our forests since it the majority of our ownership was pre it, it was industrial forest land um, and a lot of it has been harvested repeat, uh, several times and is in a younger state when we've purchased the land um, so we're looking at how can we meet our objectives as a as a landowner to create a mature forest that's uh, got complex vertical and horizontal, so like age structure and, and different size diameter trees over time um, by through uh, early 
pre-commercial intervention. So it's not with mechanized equipment. So it's putting an investment into the land, into our forests, which will help them grow better over time and then yield a result that we we are looking for on our a forest composition that we're looking for over time. So one thing we actually did the first um, crop tree release on our property this year. And so that on the left there is, it's hard to see, but there's some yellow birch and it was in a hardwood stand so that we painted the crop trees in a local contractor. So another kind of green job connection. So we had a local contractor from Greenville come out um, and he was able to girdle the trees surrounding our crop trees. So that was something and we got funding to help um, facilitate that and be able to, to put the best, uh, the effort into growing the best product going forward in a stand that was kind of that had good quality trees but was getting out there was a lot of competition from um, more intolerant or short-lived species and then up on top another thing that we another practice that's an early silvicultural um, intervention is PCT or pre-commercial thinning and this picture I borrowed from um, a source there uh, the Washington Farm Forestry Association. I just like their picture of before and after. We we have that on our prop. We started conducting PCT on our property as well. But this kind of illustrates what you're going from what the stand will look like before and then after you PCT. So again, this is allocating more space to these softwood trees. So they're coming back as one age class and. This will kind of thin, thin them out and allow more space for these to grow more quickly and to better quality products or better quality trees over time. And our goal is to turn these um, even age stands into um, uneven age or multi-age stands over time. So we would never, we're not going to go in and harvest all of them at once. It's gonna, over time, decades, it'll create a more complex structure. And the last thing I'm going to be looking at a lot is um, management of American beech on our forests. And we have a, several conservation easements on our property. So that limit our use of herbicide, and which is a common um, method of managing American beech. And we're going to look at some uh, high quality stands to conduct mechanical interventions. And this picture here is from the Umbagog, when I visited Umbagog Wildlife Refuge in Northern New Hampshire, and they used a method of cutting um, American beach kind of higher up and had success with managing beach that way. So that was that's kind of where we're going and going to do some experiments there with our beach on our property to in our hardwood stands. Um, yeah, so that's some of the stuff I'm looking at and getting involved with and among many other things, but this is what we're doing um, on the early intervention side of AMC. I think that was the end of my slides there. All right, thanks, Carolyn. Yeah, and I'll, I'll uh, walk folks through a little bit about some of my pathway, which was, uh, which was a little bit different um, uh, to get to this green job. I've had a couple different green jobs from a couple different sectors, but I started out pretty young. Um, I'm from Northern Maine, from Willimantic here in Piscataquis County. Uh, and I started my first green job and when I was in high school with a cable skitter and a chainsaw and I cut, I was a cable skitter logger for 10 years part time through high school and college and then uh, right up until I started with the AMC about 11 years ago. Uh, so really sort of working in, um, you know, on the, at the point of the chainsaw bar and in responsible forest management um, out there in the woods. Graduated high school in Dover Foxcroft and um, went, went to uh, Colby College and where I focused on, on history. And I really wanted to get into, um, I, I thought environmental law, uh, that sort of felt like a natural progression for, for my interest in forest history. I really, I focused and wrote my undergraduate thesis on the socioeconomic response to the spruce bedroom epidemic that happened here in the state of Maine in the 1970s and the 1980s. And so um, got into law school, deferred, because I sort of wasn't sure if I wanted to go fully down the law school route. Um, and ended up taking a job actually in the policy arena uh, as the Northwoods Policy Advocate for the Natural Resources Council of Maine. So I you know, kind of wanted to test the waters to see if I liked environmental law or not, and uh, did that for a couple of years. I felt pretty fortunate to get that job. Um, you know, as, as we've heard earlier in the presentation today, 
there's a lot more space in this marketplace than there was 10 to 12 years ago. Um, you know, at the time, it seemed like I was always the youngest person in the room um, in 2010, 2011, 2012. Uh, and it's really only been through the last couple of years that that started to shift. And it's exciting to see another generation come up around me. So um, I feel very personally very fortunate to have kind of been let in the door back then. But I think as a, in a, an environmental community and as in a green job space, I think the whole sector is much better at accepting new people into the space and, and recruiting people in. So I think that's a huge shift that people should take advantage of. Um, so in 2012, I was hired by AMC to, to actually start the land department. They'd owned the land since 2003, but they really had been kind of contracting out the management. And so we decided to do it more internally and joined as their land manager. And then because I don't have a forest management degree, I didn't even know this was an option. Um, you know, I'd had sort of seat of the pants experience as a logger, you know, working, thinking about production and road building and all those sorts of things. So I learned from uh, some licensed foresters that I work with that, hey, there is a pathway to licensure um, in a, through a non-degree program. So the state of Maine essentially has a really lengthy apprentice program. I would, I would, I would not recommend this um, uh, for folks, but it is an option if you're sort of like already employed in the industry or you want to kind of like test the waters and kind of like work your way in. Um, you can actually get licensed in Maine uh, through an eight-year process where you work as a as an unlicensed supervised individual. You have to have a sponsor, and then you gain a lot of on-the-job experience and document that progress. And then at the end of two years, and the end of eight years, uh, you take two exams, uh, and you can get full licensing. So that's that's what I did because I was already sort of working in this space. It made sense for me to just stick with it and get licensed. Um, and then just to kind of further illustrate this point about kind of like emergent opportunities for young people in this opportunity, in this, in this space, when I was just recently promoted to a vice president position, um, you know, uh, following in behind the, the shoes of, of two different vice presidents, one who worked for our company for 45 years and another one who worked for our company for 20 years. So um, there's a lot of opportunity out there uh, for folks that are interested. And I guess I'd say this for people that, that want to work in the green job space. I think it can be kind of hard for students um, when they think about kind of like how you enter, enter the, the work uh, because it doesn't feel as structured maybe as sort of like, you know, the, the medical profession where there's sort of like, you know, clearly defined steps to, to entering the workforce. Um, but I think what's so exciting about the green job space is that it's so broad that if you have an interest, there's probably a fit for you somewhere, whether it's like on the front lines of like working in the woods or like working in the supply logistics or, or working back in, in individual manufacturing facilities or in education or policy or forest management. There's, you know, environmental sciences is just a huge amount of, of effort. And I think um, to me, what's been really rewarding about it is it's a, it's a field that, uh, rewards um, interest. So if you're interest, interested in something and you're willing to invest your time in like pursuing that career, there's, you know, people will notice that. And it's generally a, a really good field for, um, for making connections and people tend to help each other in this field. There's not that many folks that work in this space. So if they see somebody that's really interested and in really wanting to make some change, they usually, you'll usually get help. People will help you along the way in your career. So um, it's exciting, and I hope I hope more people are interested in in joining because we need them. We need more people. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Steve. And I'll hand it to Lena. <laughs> yeah. Um, gonna share my screen again. Um, so I wanted to touch really quickly on um what I do because my job is one of the ones that uh you probably couldn't google search if you hadn't heard of it before um so my background um my degree i kind of went the general route is in natural resources but while i was in college um i concentrated in wildlife management and conservation um and so i took some specialty courses in wildlife and then um i did a lot of research um when i was in college as an undergrad, um, I worked for, I think, five different professors on 11 different research projects um, in my time. And 
I kind of took advantage of having the space to start off in volunteer positions that were research. And then once kind of word got around that I was a decent research assistant, um, people started offering to pay me, which was really nice. Um, so I highly recommend that. And I think I totally agree with what Steve was saying about how um, outdoor and environmental careers can be kind of it is very um, like kind of create your own adventure almost. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to get involved in a volunteer way or in a way that is on a very part-time basis to start off or on a seasonal basis. Um, there's a lot of seasonal work um, over the summer and in Maine, especially in the winter too. Um, and that can be a great way just to start building out resumes and doing that type of thing. Um, and I highly recommend that in high school for folks that are able to take on those types of commitments because they are awesome ways to kind of build that experience um, so that you can start off in college or just after high school graduation um, with some idea of what you like and what you don't like. Even if that's all you kind of get the gist of, um, you can go from there. Um, but once I graduated from UConn, I realized that wildlife biology is very competitive um, and they have a tendency to have a specific route oops, um, that um, tends to get you permanent positions in wildlife biology. So um, it typically requires, or to be a wildlife biologist, you typically have to go out west and do a lot of research um, in really vast open spaces and then get your master's after that. Um, and my like life circumstances didn't really accommodate that. So I started using um, the research and the experiences that I had as teaching tools instead. So I went um, into environmental education um, after doing research for a few years. Um, and my job has basically been consistently being a communicator that kind of helps bridge um, the science of natural resources and conservation and the public. Um, so my job right now, like I said, is kind of abstract, if you will. Um, my like title is director of education and project learning tree coordinator for the state of Maine. Um, but most of what I do is work with teachers and I essentially um, bridge the forest product sector and forest based sector um, to classroom students, teachers, and all of those folks. So I make things a little bit more tangible um, and also um, do quite a bit of work helping natural resource professionals communicate better with those folks. A lot of natural resource professionals um, end up being in the classroom, but they might not always have a good grasp on how to speak to a third grader versus a high schooler. Um, and so I do some stuff um, on that end of things to kind of help folks be better communicators in that sense too. Um, so, I mean, there, there definitely are environmental education, like bachelor's degrees. It's, it's one of the more rare ones, especially in the Northeast, I think, but, um, that's an option. I definitely didn't know it existed when I was in school, but you kind of get there, like I said, through an abstract, abstract path if you're just following what sounds cool. Um, so I am going to take the time to jump into some activities that can be found in the guide that you either have right now or will have after I give it to you from this session. So if this is your first win out of the woods session, you'll get um, this guide, hopefully this week or next week. Um, and these are all activities that can be found in there. If you end up having questions about what I present here, please, please feel free to let me know. I'm happy to walk folks through it, but I wanted to give a little bit of a age um, and grade level breakdown of things, kind of see how we could tie things in outside of the green jobs guide as well. Um, so one of my favorite things about the exploring your environment guide is these career corner blurbs um, that are at the bottom of student pages. Um, so all the student pages are in red at the end of each activity. Um, and the career corner is basically just a description of what one job is. Um, it usually relates to what the activity was, but it goes kind of across the board because they have them in every activity, which I really like. So it can be a great way to um, do something, especially with younger kids and younger grades, um, 
that incorporates other aspects of what you wanted to accomplish with your classroom, but also tie in the career in a lighter way. Um, or if you're having, um, I'm going to a couple elementary career days, and those can be really awesome ways, especially in Maine, to get your local community involved. Because a lot of us have um, forest product sector uh, organizations in our community that love to attend those types of things. Um, and if you're looking for those types of folks in your community, let me know, I'm happy to connect them to you. Um, these are a few other of my favorite for like younger grades and littles um, to just really do the exploratory of the concept that there are careers outside and you can kind of explore those ways and see that there are professionals out there. I think students growing up in Maine have the benefit of probably knowing somebody that works outside um, within their like small group of humans just because of the way Maine is. Um, but these can be really awesome opportunities to kind of incorporate that into the classroom if you um, have the chance to bring some professionals in. Um, these can just be filler activities and such that can be helpful too. Um, so this is one of the activities that is unique to the Explore Your Environment Guide. So it's not in the Green Jobs Guide, but I still really like it. Um, and it really is uh, looking at who works in a forest or who works outside. So it's exploring all the different types of jobs um, and allow students to kind of really dive into different areas and explore what that might look like for them. Um, and it could be a great way to kind of combine that with um, the Green Jobs quiz so they can kind of see what their skills are and kind of take it from there. Um, and then with middle and high school, one of my favorite activities to do is if you were the boss. Um, the student pages in the back of this activity, I think are awesome. Um, and it essentially allows students to take um, a parcel of land. It could be real, like if you happen to have a forest um, close to your school or your town has a land trust that has a forested property, you could definitely make it specific to somewhere local. Um, but you can also make it a hypothetical area as well. Um, and it actually goes through the whole process of looking at how you would manage that forested area. It has worksheets to break down what the different options are for managing it. Um, what the cost breakdown of that is, like if you're going to do a harvest of some trees, how much that would cost and could you generate money from a harvest like that? Um, and at the same time, it also incorporates all the different people that would help you do that um, and the different careers along the way. So you kind of get a really good grasp on um, looking at a forest and then going from what we call stump to log or stump to product um, and getting a really good sense of what the forest product sector is because it is such a big role in Maine's economy. Um, it can be really helpful in that sense as well. So um, I wanted, I point this out during um, all of our sessions, but I just wanted to make sure you all know that these resources exist. Um, so in the back of the guide, there are a couple different indices that you can sort through. Um, one of them is by different standards or groups of standards. Another of them is by like, overarching topic, like you could search climate or you could search um, involving your community, those types of things um, to kind of narrow down your search. So you have a little bit of a better grasp of what activities to look at. Um, and then there are also correlations for every activity for every grade level. So if that's something that you need help navigating, feel free to let me know because I can definitely dive in deeper um, if there are specific questions that folks have. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to share about is our Forest of Maine Teachers Tours. Um, so our application for this event opened at the beginning of this month. Um, it is a four-day immersive um, professional development event. You get 30 credit hours um, for your teacher certificate. Um, and we essentially spend two days doing professional development um, in the more like traditional sense, doing activities and talking about um, implementation and navigating different barriers at your school and all of that. And then the other two days are um, what we call tour days where we go out to different locations um, and they could be forested parcels, they can be land trust properties, they could, we always go to a um, mill of some sort. Um, and so we really get a good grasp of 
what things look like from stump to product, like I was mentioning before. Um, so it's a really great opportunity to kind of be immersed in what the main woods is. Um, so we have two different options for that. One is based in the Katahdin region and the other is based in Down East. Um, and those rotate every year. So we do different locations in Maine year to year. Um, but if you have other questions on that, I'd be happy to answer them as well. Um, but with that, we can kind of switch to questions here if we have any. I'll jump in um, just as people have a chance to think about what questions they may have. Um, thank you, Steph, uh, Carolyn, and Steve for your presentation. I think that it's really interesting to see the varied backgrounds that you all have and how you ended up there. Um, Steph, it just resonated with me that you uh, started as an undergrad in biology for uh, pre-med kind of, that's exactly what I did. I started pre-med, pre-dental, and uh, decided to uh, that I really liked plants and that's where I decided to go. Um, maybe instead, if there's no questions from the teachers in the audience, maybe uh, I'll turn it around to um, them and ask, ask you a question. Um, when you have a student that is um, inclined to more outdoorsy types of activities, what, what kind of things do you do with them or what kind of activities do you have in the classroom that help, help guide them towards um, more out, uh, being able to explore the outdoors a little bit more. The, the reason I ask is uh, when I speak to uh, people at the University of Maine that are responsible for enrollment at the School of Forest Resources, what they hear most often um, is it's not necessarily the guidance counselors or administrators that are um, helping guide students to their programs. It's usually direct relationships with teachers that encourage them into certain pathways. And so whatever we can do to help facilitate that process is, is what we're interested in doing. Um, but we need to know uh, from, from your perspective what, what's helpful. And if you don't have an answer now, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to throw it out there and um, start the conversation somewhere. And I'll piggyback off of that because I, I think Logan, like when we work with students, sometimes it's just getting them exposed to some of those careers. So some of them don't even know what careers exist. Um, we had one student that we worked with at Penquist High School that after he heard Steve talk for one class period, uh, decided to apply to UMaine for their um, forestry program and is currently still there. So it's, it's, yeah, it's really exciting um, to see those seeds being planted. Um, but a lot of it, I think, just comes down to um, exposure. Um, for us, one of our next steps is we are um, having a green job fair I'm working with Lena on and I'm sure Steve and or Carolyn will will be there to talk to students but it will be a chance for us to bring a whole bunch of professionals to one place as well as the area schools to learn more so I think any opportunities that students can get um, to just get exposed to different careers is really exciting. And if you have the opportunity to take students on field trips to see those places or have those guest speakers into your classroom, you never know. It, it could just be one student, but it could make all the difference. So um, it's really exciting and it's been really nice to be able to use that Green Jobs curriculum um, from PLT. So I'm Sarah Otterson, and I taught second grade for um, <clears throat> 27 years. And um, <clears throat> I um, worked with a um, project learning tree 
um, quite a bit, but I'm retired now. And um, in my school district, which is Oxford Hills, it's in Western Maine, <clears throat> we are a uh, comprehensive uh, high school in which we have a tech school. And so I have um, oh, around 15 acres of land with pretty, pretty big pine trees. And so I've had the um, tech school forestry kids here for the last month. And um, <clears throat> I mean, the trees are probably 150 feet tall, you know, very mature. And they've been cutting them down and, um, you know, skidding them out. And uh, they're, they're taking their equipment somewhere else now, but um, uh, they've, they've just been wonderful. And I don't know if you folks ever come and talk to them, but they're definitely like, a, <clears throat> I was watching a 17 year old just back and, you know, uh, just handle a huge skitter, you know, just like he was born to it. And it's, it's, you know, obviously that's what he's going to be doing. He's going to be logging. And I'm not sure that any of them would go on, you know, to uh, four year college, but might be you know, now with um, two-year colleges available, you know, and I'm not quite sure what there is available for, you know, forestry. I'm sure there's big equipment, uh, you know, classes that they can take in community college, but, you know, maybe, maybe you guys can address that for me. Yeah, um, so we do work with the CTE schools. Um, Logan can be a little bit more specific, but um, our one of our programs that's under our umbrella is Certified Logging Professionals, um, which is a curriculum that trains um, loggers and other folks that operate that type of equipment to do their job safely um, and to get that exposure. And so there's an apprentice track for that. Um, and the CTE schools allow for the students to get that exposure before graduation. So they are that one step up of um, folks who might, might not know that exists. Um, so it is an opportunity and it doesn't have to be something that's done through um, a two year or a four year institution, which is helpful for some folks that know that that path isn't for them. Um, but I think another thing that's super important that we're trying to do more of is make sure that middle schoolers in, in the realms of the CTE schools know that those programs exist um, and that those opportunities are there and um, what those opportunities would lead them to. Um, I've talked to a few different forestry or natural resource tech school um, educators and they sometimes can have a really hard time filling their program. Um, and so making sure that the middle schoolers know that that's an option um, and what that would look like and where that might land them um, is also something that we've been trying to prioritize um, to further the, um, those types of programs along and make sure that they're sustainable over time. Yeah, and just quickly to add um, onto the apprenticeship uh, concept. So that's something that the Certified Lighting Professional Program has done in the past. Um, I'd like to consider some things in hibernating stand, uh, as, as hibernating at the moment, um, just while we're trying to figure out the direction of certain programs. But CLP's apprenticeship program is definitely one that we want to revitalize. Um, and what it does is for students that go through things like the Oxford Hills Technical uh, Center program or uh, other similar programs that are found in the state is once they complete uh, the program and graduate, um, instead of taking two years to get their certified logging professional certificate, they can um, get their initial site visit done um, after six months after graduating. And then that way they have that credential. Um, and that is an individual credential. So there's a couple different logging certification programs, um, but we do individual professional logger certification. And so that um, stays with the professional throughout time. And so assuming they keep up with their uh, education, um, they would be able to maintain that. And that, that can be desirable to some employers or um, be an opportunity for them to market themselves individually Julie, once they graduate. I know Steve mentioned running a cable skitter uh, probably before he graduated high school. I know I had plenty of friends that were doing the same thing. And something like that can go a long way to get somebody started, especially if they want to spend their life in the woods. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Thank 
thank you for being a landowner and allowing access to your land uh, for those students. I think, think, think that's an incredible story to share. Yeah, they were great. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, if we don't have any more questions, um, please know that we'll all be here to answer questions if you have them or come across any um, or have thoughts or ideas on how you could implement um, things down the line. Um, all of our emails are here and the emails that you've been getting from me, these folks are also CC'd if that's easier for you to just grab it from there. Um, and the recording for this um, will be sent out soon. And you can also, um, I've been doing the contact hours for these in batches. So I'll be doing this one at the end of the spring sessions, which is finishing up in May. So, um, but if you need it sooner, just let me know. I'd be happy to do that for you. Um, but thank you all for joining us and to our folks at uh, AMC for helping out today. Um, it's really a pleasure to spend the time. Thank you. Thank you for having Thanks. us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.